Welcome to the Libertarian Counterpoint. I'm Richard Fields. On the show today, we have Fred Rouse, uh, a water use efficiency consultant and uh, uh, engineer. Uh, Jason McPhee, welcome to the show. Uh, thank you very much for being here. The Service Employees International Union is sponsoring a piece of, uh, I, I think, an odious piece of legislation. It's AB 1250. It would stop the outsourcing of financial, economic, accounting, engineering, legal, and other jobs by counties. Why? Uh, what would justify my bad opinion on that, uh, Jason? Yeah, I think whenever you have a situation where you, you limit competition, and that's exactly what these types of things do, is uh, when you decide to uh, put something into just the purview of government, essentially put a monopoly on it, then you are restricting competition. And when that happens, you generally tend to get worse outcomes over time. Well, it's not only restricting competition. Let's say that you have a county where, oh, let's say the... Uh, I don't know, the engineering uh, is not, a, not really a full-time job. It might be, you know, a half-time job or a, a job, you know, a one-and-a-half-time job, but you've got to hire a full-time or two full-time employees who are going to sit around half the time. Uh, but there'll be county employees getting uh, uh, county pensions or uh, Caltrans pensions, uh, government uh, employment benefits, etc. Unions like that. But the county uh, is going to be spending a whole lot more than if they just consulted with somebody on a uh, uh, on a hourly basis, right? Sure. These things essentially just set up a trajectory for growth in government, and which, is, of course, is what the union is all about. They want to a increase the number of government employees, to increase the number of union members, so that they uh, can uh, make the pension problem even worse than it already is. Sure. <laughs> Yeah, the, the cities had the clout in the legislature to be written out of this language. They were originally included in this bill. They were going to have to comply by these same um, requirements that will now only apply to the counties. Counties apparently haven't figured out a way to finagle their way out of this yet. But in addition to um, potentially slowing down the functioning of county operations because of the reason you mentioned, you know, maintaining a level of staffing to account for all circumstances and contingencies as opposed to permanent government employee staffing, as opposed to hiring consultants or contractors as needed to do the work when the need arises, can be a very expensive long-term proposition. And I think the issue of government pensions and benefits and management too. Most government bureaucracies have multi layers of, of supervision and management and the way this bill is written my understanding is that that those costs in, in comparing the costs for um, hiring a contractor versus maintaining the workload or the functions in-house inside the government entity, the county, um, the costs of all of that those levels of management and supervision, administrative overhead is not included when consider doing the cost comparison between the county and the, um, oh, the so they're, contract. They're, they're, working so they're, really, bad, they're working with bad numbers as well. It's really loaded towards trying to really discourage the use of contractors for anything. It's going to drive up the cost for hiring contractors because they have to go prevailing wage and they have to provide you know certain benefits and they have to they don't have to not benefits as generous as government employees get but they have to provide a certain level of benefits and they've got to comply with all the anti-discrimination law and they've you know they've got to um, the compliant costs drive, drive up the cost yeah uh, there's another that. provision that if if the contract value is greater than a hundred thousand dollars the uh, the contractor has to supposedly pay for an audit to be performed by the county to demonstrate that their costs actually ended up being lower than what the government, the county's costs would have been, which won't include the over administrative overhead. And the law says, and the, and the contractor can't include that audit cost in their, you know, and they can't bill the county for that cost. Well, come on. I mean, that's ridiculous. They're well, going to the, pad the, their, their charges somehow to recover the cost of the audit. And the larger issue is why is the state, one level of government, dictating to the county, another uh, independent level of government, 
how the county can run its, uh, its, its affairs. It seems right. to me that you've got a separation of powers issue, at least, uh, at least theoretically. Yeah, ideally all power should be devolved down to the lowest possible level to encourage that there's the greatest responsiveness to the needs of the situation. I mean, any time that kind of the, the decision making is constrained or restricted or regulated by some other level, it's going to complicate things. It's going to be less accountable to the local needs. Yeah, clearly. Um, to, the st to the extent that the feds r regulate the state or the state regulates the counties, it's, we're less, it's less and less representative and less and less democratic and less and less responsive and more and more expensive. The National Football League has been really hard-nosed about uh, testing for drugs, uh, up, down to and including cannabis. But just uh, in the last uh, few uh, weeks, the NFL has offered to collaborate with the Players Union on cannabis research for, for pain control. Is this a uh, harbinger of good things to come as far as the uh, uh, way that culture and way that society looks at, uh, at the medical uses, at least, of cannabis? I certainly hope so. I mean, the, the NFL certainly is a very visible organization, and so when they make a move like this, hopefully the rest of society is taking some cues when they're paying attention to it. But, you know, i got, I got to say, too, with the NFL, one of the uh, stark things in the past is is they've really cracked down on people in the past for marijuana use. I, being a Miami Dolphins fan myself, uh, we had Ricky Williams back in the day when he was uh, – um, Heisman Trophy winner and uh, he, he came to Miami in I think 2002 and they had uh, essentially suspended him just because he used marijuana and so this is a person at the top of their career had over 10,000 yards in his career he actually had several breaks in his career due to use in, in marijuana and at the same time while the league just voriciously uh, I guess uh, sells its alcohol and, and promotes, uh, you know, the idea of people drinking and the idea that, you know, uh, something like uh, marijuana, it's, it's really kind of contradictory, which is a lot of things with the war on drugs, I think. Well, it's also interesting. I mean, uh, the, uh, the NFL and, and uh, professional sports in general is, I think, probably notorious for using uh, strong uh, analgesic, strong uh, opioids, uh, other kinds of drugs for pain management when uh, the players are injured. Uh, and I think the, the union's interest in this beyond the general principles is that it makes a lot more sense to use uh, uh, cannabis uh, as a, uh, uh, a pain, a pain uh, man, uh, management technique than, than it does to use uh, certainly opioids. Certainly, yeah, it's, uh, you know, a, a lot of these guys, I mean, they're out there getting concussions, and which is also a big deal right now in the NFL, and, and the idea that, you know, you have this league that's suspending people for taking things that help their pain, <laughs> when, you know, they're essentially inflicting themselves with these concussions is, is just, you know, it seems pretty, a pretty telling statement about our war on drugs, I guess, but, but uh, it's, it's a good move, I think, for the NFL that they're actually starting to, to take a look at being a little easier on this. I um, I have a medical marijuana card and I got it because I like to grow things. You should see my garden, it's great. But I, I grow three pot plants every year and I don't like to get high. I have friends with cancer um, and I've, you know, they have prescriptions, they have their cards and so I'm able to provide them with um, some of what I grow. But the, um, the interesting thing to me is this year I have high CBD strains. So there's two major, the, the pharmacology lesson everybody, um, marijuana, the psychoactive constituent is THC. And there's other cannabinoids in there, but the primary other cannabinoid is CBD, cannabidiol. And cannabidiol is not psychoactive but it's very effective, anti-inflammatory, not as analgesic, not as good for pain as THC, but if you combine the CBD with the THC, you can get all the effects and not get high. The CBD cancels out the psychoactive effect. So in my opinion, based on the research I've done and the latest medical research, CBD is really kind of 
the end game for cannabis. And so I went out to buy clones this year and it was very hard to find high CBD clones at any of the dispensaries here in Sacramento. They didn't have them. All that's out there is the high THC stuff. I'm hoping that changes. If that to what do you attribute that situation? Because most people use marijuana because it gets them high, and that's okay. Oh, so, that, so that's the market. The market demand is for THC as opposed right. to CBD. The market demand is for THC. CBD is what cancer patients and epilepsy patients and people with inflammatory diseases, multiple sclerosis that are don't feel comfortable when they are under the influence of THC. CBD is what they want, but it's not widely available yet. That will change in the near future, in the coming two, three, four, five years, I believe. We'll see a lot more of the pot that is truly medically beneficial without the psychoactive side effects. I don't like the feeling of being stoned myself. Um, so the CBD, I think, I, I look at it as I'm not really big into modern medicine and allopathic medicine, and I think a lot of the pharmaceuticals do more harm than good. So if and when I ever do get sick with some kind of inflammatory condition, um, I'll have some of this stuff that I'll self-administer. Um, but I, I think CBD has a whole lot of potential for the kind of um, CTE, the injuries, the brain swelling and inflammation, the chronic brain inflammation that is causing these problems for these multiple concussions that these football players have. Yeah, wasn't there a study that just came out recently that says almost all pro football players have a history of concussions? I'm sure it was a self-selected, okay, so there was a group of I think 110 brains that were donated to science from former football players. Um, by themselves or their prior to their deaths or their families and there was probably some selection bias there because uh, the people that had the yeah. symptoms were the ones that wanted to know and donated their brain so it's not everybody but it's a significant percentage you know some people are more uh, um, just get inflammation and the inflammation causes damage all of our immune systems are different we all react differently to injury or insult or whatever so it's hard to know who's going to really be affected and who's not in advance. It's hard to know. But you know, it's funny on that whole concussion issue. Um, I was on a community college football team for one year. And, you know, when, when you were out there on the field, I mean, that was the instruction. You know, you, you know, come with hat when you come in right. for the tackle. So, I mean, you know, it's, it's not surprising at all that, you know, almost all these guys would get their bell rung, not even in just games, but in practices occasionally too. Yeah, and it's the linemen that really have the biggest problem because every every play they're smashing into each other. You know, the guys on the offensive and defensive lines, and they're big guys. Expensive. California, uh, speaking of community college and and uh, state college, California State University is dropping its algebra requirement uh, for non-math and uh, science majors. I'm wondering what an old uh, algebra teacher has to say about that. Yeah, it's really interesting. I mean. I taught math, science, middle school, math, science 10, 15 years ago, and we had seventh graders that were doing algebra. Um, most of the, most typical ninth grade is when kids take algebra. If you're, you know, if you're a pretty strong math student, eighth grade, um, and I would say a third to half of the kids at the time were taking algebra, and it was really wasn't watered down what I was teaching. There were seventh graders, and these were the exceptional kids and they generally did better than the eighth graders I mean they were just the cream of the crop and so seventh grade algebra was not a problem for them and your brain develops at different people at different times and some people just have the ability and some people don't but we have this idea now right that everybody has to go to college God forbid you got a plumbing job and made eighty thousand dollars a year or, you know God forbid you were a, a sheetrocker guy and made sixty thousand dollars a year or whatever you can't we can't have that or an electrician or whatever um, everybody has to go to college and have a desk job somewhere otherwise they're a failure you know their parents feel like they're failures everybody's expected to go even though the cost of higher education is just like gone through the roof because of all the subsidies that have been provided by the government. Well, yeah, that that and, and the uh, former chancellor of the University of California, Davis, uh, Katehi, is now teaching, I think, two or three courses, but being paid like a chancellor. Right. Well, well so 
I heard something recently, um, and this is a well-supported statistic. Half of the kids that graduate from um, from high school nationwide right now graduate with an A minus GPA or above, three point seven out of four or above, fifty percent. Mm -hmm. So what we have is this well, massive it's, it's, rate it's, inflation. They're all, they're all above average. You can talk right. We're Lake Wobegon. You can talk to any college professor, and they will tell you that the majority of kids that are coming in need remedial math and remedial English. They don't have the skills necessary. So everybody is pushed up. We have an education system that is based entirely, grouped entirely based on age. Nobody's retained. Nobody's, you know, accelerated and pushed forward, in the, at least in the public system. Everybody's grouped on age. It, I mean, it's no way to run an education system. <laughs> so... Well, and one of the funny things about that, when you talk about these great inflation and everything else, everybody's doing better and yet nobody can do algebra, <laughs> which is right. apparently what they're saying. But, you know, one of the other things I think is interesting about this is that the standard for C, uh, CSU and UC is that they have a requirement that everybody who comes there has two years of, of uh, foreign language, and yet they're cutting their you know, requirement, I guess, for algebra. And it just seems like, you know, algebra, you know what are your priorities? I mean, you know, we want to be a... A uh, society that is more competitive globally, you know, and if, if that's the case, you know, uh, stuff like algebra, that's basic problem solving. And it's basic problem solving. It's, it's, it's kind of, math is kind of its own language, you know, you have to learn it, and some people learn it, you know, a little quicker than others, but algebra is slightly abstract. I mean, when I first heard this, I thought, oh, calculus, yeah, maybe not, not maybe everybody doesn't have to know calculus to graduate. Algebra? You're kidding me. Man, this is what we do in middle school and we're letting kids graduate from community colleges because they can't do it. And then I heard, you know, and then I heard it's mostly the kids that are one of the news stories I heard on the radio. It's mostly the kids that are you know, from immigrant families or whatever, and I'm thinking. I'm guessing that the kids from immigrant families probably do a hell of a lot better. Probably, on, uh, on and I, I mean, courses than, than their their than language skills and whether or not they are fluent in English as a first language shouldn't really have that much to do with algebra. Well, in my in, opinion, in, I in, mean, in fairness, they're talking about non-math or science majors. Right. I mean, I, you know, I'm, I'm guessing that engineers are still going to have to uh, exactly. know their algebra. But this is a base. <laughs> I look at it as a test. I mean, it's a algebra is something. Look, if you cannot <clears throat> master or at least develop some kind of competency in algebra, should you really be, you know, college material? Should you be? And I thought I don't think so. I mean, I, there's plenty of other things you can do, but you know. College shouldn't be wasted on people that can't handle algebra. But you know, part of the funny thing is too with this is that, um, you know, it's, it's what is college doing for us nowadays other than being a filter? And if the filter is, is lowering to such a standard that it doesn't even say if a person can do basic math, you know, which is algebra. I mean, that's a really basic standard of competency for math. And it's, it's it, what is, you know, if we're lowering the bar that low, it's sort of like, what's the purpose? You know, I kind of like the Peter Thiel idea, which is uh, pay kids that are smart to drop out of school and uh, start a Skip business. Skip it. They're yeah, wasting time. It's not, it's, you know, the, the filter is not anything more than a filter anymore. And particularly if you're majoring in, in you know, uh, some of these ridiculous majors that you know on, on, in the social science side, women and gender studies. Yeah, no, I'm you know, sorry, there, there sorry, are, there, ladies. There, but there yeah. are there are majors that are absolutely worthless on the market because other than to get a job teaching it uh, to to other victims. Right. Uh, so my kids, 25 and 22, they've graduated from with bachelor's degrees and um, from UCs. You know, one went to Berkeley, one went to Santa Barbara. And really the standard in any scientific field now is if you want to get a decent job, you pretty much have to get a master's. I mean, that's not always true, but because of the lowering of the, because everybody gets A's and, you know, I mean, that's what kind of everybody is doing now. You go to grad school and that's kind of unfortunate. Well, you know, and another funny thing about this, too, is it shows the misalignment in incentives uh, with our whole higher education system. Uh, the idea that they're forcing people to take or not take things that aren't really market-driven, like you were talking about before, or at least alluded to. And 
uh, you know, Milton Friedman had an interesting idea a long time ago where he talked about trying to more closely align the school's incentives with the students' incentives, and that's to, to say that uh, essentially school would be free because the, the school would get a portion of your earnings for the rest of your life, but suddenly that would tie the incentives so that the school wouldn't teach you stuff that you know, had no realistic chance of bringing in a back a return. So I, hadn't, I hadn't heard that. Yeah, yeah that's, that's, a, a, that's, that's an interesting That's an idea. interesting concept. Sure. Certainly it's, it wouldn't have to be universal. That's kind of the it, ultimate it would, quality control. Yeah, it's like, yeah. That would work. It, it, that's the kind of a thing that would work very well in a private uh, education Perfect outcome-based education. A private something. education yeah. market where you don't have the uh, public choice problem of uh, uh, schools and faculties and uh, administrative staffs uh, growing and growing and growing because there's all this free, so-called free money out there for college loans. Because sure. right, right now, I mean, anybody, can, anybody that can fog a mirror can get a college loan uh, and probably get admitted someplace or another. And so we're, we're, we're putting a whole lot of people through college with huge college debts and then they, they get degrees in, in the social sciences someplace or another where they have absolutely no value in the job market, but they've still got that uh, college debt that's undischargeable in bankruptcy. It's a, it's a, right, it's, it's with a, you forever. Yeah, yeah. it's a total uh, vicious circle. That, it's uh, quite a societal betrayal. I mean, you're given this message as you're going through the public school that you've got to get that you know, college education and then you go take the loans and then suddenly you have a, a burden that you can't easily pay off. It's so, almost enough to make us want to start our own country. Uh, <laughs> well, Seasteading, sea ephemerile, anybody? Yeah, ephemeral, the brainchild back around 2001, I believe. Speaking of, of Milton Friedman? Patry Friedman, right? This is the grandson of the Milton Friedman. Grandson yeah, of Milton, son of David, yes. Yeah, and he's a, a currently a Google employee, I think. Yeah. Brilliant guy. Yeah. But he And he was a burner for a while. He was, uh, you know, one of those. I've never been to Burning Man. Have you guys been to Burning I've been Man? to Burning Man, yes. Have you? Okay. Yeah. I thought about it, but I think I might be too old. But anyway. Nobody's too old. He... Um, yeah, I've heard so many good things about it, but he was kind of inspired by that and also by his libertarian, it must be in his genes, I guess. Oh, yeah. He thought, wow, if we can establish a kind of a libertarian, quasi-capitalo-anarchist -capitalo society out on our own little island in international waters somewhere. Manufactured island. Manufactured island, right. Um, then wouldn't that be cool? We could you know, live and let live and not have to follow the rules from um, the man and, and all that. And that might work out fine. Well, it's, it's an evolving, I guess, it's an evolving process. And they get together once a year, like a big party camp out thing. They do it in the Delta. Um, that, that's the, the ephemeral. San Joaquin. Yeah, yeah. yeah the ephemeral. And um, it's, you know, they've worked through some of the issues heading toward nationhood, I think. But they're, they're, growing um, organically and slowly they haven't got years ago there were big plans right there were people ready to sign up to live on like a cruise ship time 10 times 10 country and um, there was a lot of kind of hopeful talk to me you know it verges a little on the yeah let's all go to Mars thing well how are you gonna grow your food you know how are you gonna eat out there where are you gonna are you still Basically, civilization relies on um, production of grains at scale, and you can't do that in the ocean. Vertical, vertical farming. Vertical, vertical farming. farming. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> but you know, you think about Hong Kong, and Hong Kong is an example of essentially, in, in a way, kind of an island. I mean, they are connected to China, right. but they're, they've been cut off for a long time. Well, Singapore is an island. Exactly, sure. And, and the idea that, you know, these guys are essentially doing it by trade. So it's not that they have to grow their stuff, and yet they have an extraordinarily high standard of living in these places. Because they have uh, an extraordinarily free market. Exactly. Particularly when it comes to trade. Yes. I mean, that's the key. So ephemeral or well, Seastead, you know, if they have a completely open market, open borders, uh, open to immigration, open to uh, trading across their so-called border, uh, you know, they can, they can do very well, I, I would think. I mean, all, all they would have to do would be to have a nascent industry within the walls of, of their own country. They'd have to have something of value. To, to export in return for the imports of food and other uh, stuff. Most likely that would sure. be a lot of smart labor, <laughs> a lot of smart <laughs> Yeah, people. probably a lot of computer I would nerds, think so. Sort of mm -hmm. I mean, um, they would probably set up a fairly strict um, 
immigration system to make sure that the people that they were allowing on board weren't going to become, you know, dependent. Well, I think what you do is you just don't have any any uh, opportunity for dependents. Exactly. Anybody right. can come, but you know if you if don't you get, but you're not gonna you're not gonna get any welfare or, or anything like that. Don't set up the mal incentives in the first place. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So I right. that it would be a play. It it would be a great laboratory for libertarianism for sure. And you can always grow hydroponic tomatoes. Yes, you oh, could. Oh, maybe not. Maybe you would have a problem with uh, visitors if you grow hydroponic uh, tomatoes. Tell us about that, uh, Jason. Well, apparently there was a story recently where the, uh, uh, I'm not sure if it was the DEA or, or the local police, but they had uh, busted into a home in Chicago because they thought that somebody was growing uh, marijuana inside their home. I, I, and it turned out they were growing plants. It just was tomatoes and not marijuana. <laughs> and, and of course, uh, this is just yet another, I guess, uh, perverse result of the war on drugs and the idea that you know you could do something perfectly legitimate in your own home and have the government busting into your home in the middle of the night you know and we've had so many cases similar to this you know where people bust into people's houses and they wind up shooting their dogs you know or uh, I think or shooting the people oh shooting the people in yeah. fact there was a case uh, not too long ago a few years back where there was a flashbang grenade that was thrown into a baby's crib you know by the by the police and it was just you know the idea that we have this stuff going on it's it's just beyond the pale uh, and it's it's growing our prison industrial complex uh, you know for essentially victimless crimes it's just yeah what I what I remember reading about this case was that the raid was actually conducted on 420 for publicity purposes oh by the county sheriff's office so they thought <laughs> 420 is a big marijuana users day for whatever reason, and, and they, got the, they got their information from a, from a store. That sells yeah, they like they were them. monitoring license plates at a hydroponic supply store downtown, and they were and they used a list of people that had gone there, and they went and they got a bunch of warrants, and so they had a warrant, and they busted in. They found tea bags in the garbage too, tea, and they thought it was they they said that was pot. And so the bunch of guys all dressed up in SWAT gear busted down the door one morning, and you know. Uh, the court just said, no, sorry, the cops are on the hook for this. You can't go breaking the Fourth Amendment doing this stuff. And so that's, that's good news. And that's good news. And we'll, we'll end the show with good news. This has been the Libertarian Counterpoint on the air on uh, www.accesssacramento.org, Channel 17 in Sacramento, uh, cable channels all over the place, and uh, on YouTube eventually. So look for it. Thank you. We'll see you again next week.